We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Good morning and welcome to a, another edition of Free Association Radio. This is Robert Phoenix. I'm your host. And uh, I do this three days a week. Monday is the the rant sort of a version of my show. And uh, Wednesday is astrology. And Friday is the interview portion. And if you miss Friday's show... Uh, let me uh, go back in time, 72 hours. It was with uh, Max Vigilante, the uh, director of Vigilante, Vigilante, a very interesting film documentary about graffiti, art, public space, personal expression, freedom, and the consequences that go along with that kind of experience. Today will be a very different kind of show. Uh, I had the opportunity to interview a woman by the name of Nia Nell, who is a singer-songwriter from South Africa. She's quite lovely. I'd never heard of her before, and a publicist brought her to my attention. And um, it was uh, it was really a pleasure getting to know her on the phone, and she's a really wonderful singer-songwriter. She's kind of like a, a cross between, I don't know, maybe Enya – and uh, Trisha Yearwood, because she has the ability to sing in kind of a country and western twang, and there are these sort of lush orchestrations and uh, arrangements that go along with her music that are very, I don't want to use the word new agey, but romantic. There's a definite, definitely a romantic quality to her sound. Anyway, uh, she's written a book as well. It's called Knowing Who I Am. And it's really kind of a a self-help primer and getting to the core of you know, kind of who you are or who she is as an individual and how that loving yourself is the most important thing we can do. Now, it sounds really mundane, but it's true. It is true. Loving yourself is really, really freaking important. Now, there's it's a fine line between loving yourself and narcissism, or maybe not such a fine line because narcissists are pretty easy to spot, uh, which is loving, loving oneself a bit too much. But the foundation for all religious belief is in some ways rooted in the notion that, this, that you would love the self to the point where you could take care of it, and then there would be a, a, a kind of a next level 
response to the universe, which would be the invocation of, you know, a divine presence, which would either intermingle or co-create or um, being able to uh, blend with a uh, divine intelligence, God as it were. And by loving oneself, you create the, the garden bed for that. It's like, okay, I love myself enough. I'm, ex- I'm an extension of this. I'm an extension of you, God. So therefore, by loving myself, I have prepared myself to have this wonderful experience living a co-creative and sacredly divine life. Typically, that's how that model would work. So we talk a little bit about that. We talk a little bit about our music. This is, by the way, recorded last week. So I wanted to bring something up, though. I wanted to open today's show up with a very interesting thread that came my way. And this is from Facebook. And this this is, again, this notion of self and non-self. And who are we and what are we and where are we? And what happens when we place our trust in something that is seemingly quite outside of ourselves. So this was given to me by uh, uh, Frank, a.k.a. Sarson, and it was a very interesting thread. I I didn't know who this guy was until I saw this thread from Frank, and his name is Greg Giles, and he is a, I guess he's a channel. This is what his Facebook page reads. It reads, hello, uh, let's see, uh, um, let me go back to his. I am an Osequeek starseed from the star system of Tari C. Here at this time on assignment to advance my education and assist humanity in their awakening and their transformation through the many earth changes that will advance this world to the standards of a galactic society. I am an interdimensional channel for the Galactic Federation of Light. And my star family, an 11-dimensional Osequake collective of the Ashtar Command, Orisa, Amanda, Rona, Jella, Morgana, Sophia, Germana, Capella, Jackie, Romana, Angela, Patricia, Anthony, Gifta, Maria, Mercula, Pirka, Ramulet, Augusta, Chevron, Tom, Thomas, Uritel. And this is his tribe, his star seed tribe a network of light workers. He's got 3,102 subscribers. So this guy has been channeling the Galactic Federation. Okay, so I'm just setting the, the stage for what I'm about to read you, if I can find the exact post, which will take me just a moment. Hold on here. Apparently, he had gone dark for a while, and this is what he says. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your kind-hearted and warm sentiments. I am just fine. These messages shared through me have not been messages from the Galactic Federation of Light or Ashtar Command, not even since the beginning. Think about that. Not even since the beginning. So this guy, who has 3,000 people on his page... People have been following him and listening to this channeled information now tells all of them, not since the beginning. The reason I believe this is, is because if the cabal suddenly tapped into my line to the GFL, don't you think the GFL would repair this problem? It's really obvious to me that all these messages have been coming from someplace else. This makes me question whether any of this galactic federation of light or ascension talk is real. One of the reasons I believe all this is because I was receiving messages myself. I now doubt all channels. I really think they are receiving messages from the same source, or they, or, they, or they are just making this stuff up as they go. We shall see, right? One channel has talked about prosperity funds going back forever now. Has anyone seen a dime? Does anyone really believe they ever will? Mass arrest, it's obvious that it, it is not true either. We would have seen something transpiring, but we have not. If 2012 ends with no ascension for anyone, will you believe? I am sorry if the messages shared through me got your hopes up 
but I was only sharing what I definitely heard in my mind, which leads us to mind control slash mind influence. This has been a great wake-up call for all of us. It was done with simple radio waves. That's all. Not too difficult, really. Let's stick together here. We have all made very good friends. Let's see how this plays out, because I certainly do not know. And yes, this is Greg. No one has kidnapped me or anything like that. I hope you're all doing okay through this. I know it is a very difficult time for us all. This has been quite an ordeal. And listen, stick to your convictions if this is what you wish to do. I will honor and respect all of your views, and I'm interested to hear them. Peace, love, and light to you all. Exclamation, your friend, Greg. This elicited 310 comments. 310 comments. Wow. Here's some of the comments. The first comment of oh, the previous comments. Let's go. I mean, this is such a long list of comments. Let me just go through the list here. Some of these people are crushed. Uh, this woman says, I was wondering for a few days ago whether or not the GFL was the bad guys. Amazing synchronicity. Who was really behind this? Peace, love, and light your way too, Greg. It's good to hear from you. It took me some time to see you too, Greg. Know your center. If you wish to talk to me, I'm here. Oh. I'm so glad you have awakened. So I keep up the post and put up the picture up and cause such drama. Sigh. What about the Ashtar Command, Sheldon Nidell, and others? Are they all fake? Question mark. I find this hard to believe. Ha, ha, ha. Never believed it. I listen to my heart and own soul and messages from my own guys. But nice trick. I love it and love fantasy myself. There is no GF of L or Ashtar Command. That's what Greg is telling you. So all the others are fake, too. Time to move on and get your shit together, people. Like he said, Greg, did you know that the Nazis got a lot of their advanced information through channeling? Pull your energies. Do not let this post lower your vibrations. Whatever you believe, your vibrations are what's important here. 20 people like them, by the way. What about Cryon and Bashar? They're well-respected, even in the UN. Beware of Cryon and Bashar. Bashar is a fake, by the way. The total fake. I've been studying channeling since the 1980s, and I can spot a fake channel a mile away, 500 miles away. Cryon is not from God either. I can tell. I agree. Good? Only the real love in your hearts will guide you through the real truth. We are the Galactic Federation. We are the light workers of love to all humanity. And all the universe, even if it is a lie, is the best lie ever. <laughs> I love that. This guy's name is... Uh, I, I, probably, I should probably say that. But uh, let me read that again. Only the real love in your hearts will guide you to the real truth. Okay? We are the Galactic Federation of Light. We are the light workers of love to all humanity. And all the universe, even if it is a lie, it's the best lie ever. How do you, how do you reconcile that, that paragraph? First of all, he's talking about real truth. I, I guess is there fake truth? I thought truth is just truth, right? Through the real truth. Isn't, isn't something that's not truth, untrue, or a lie? Can there be any more truth than truth? Real, really real truth? Seven people like that, by the way. Yes, we all are here, David. Whatever that means. It's all good. Your message got tampered. But we will still exist in love and light, abundance, prosperity, and freedom. Okay. Install a fire, psychic firewall and keep the tinnitus ringing loud. 
Yes, because because we all love tinnitus. We all love the piercing ear ringing that we get throughout the day. I won't accept this until I see a YouTube video of you and your brother saying this on camera. The Supreme Creator is who we need to be talking to. That is what will save us, not prophets and saviors that the religions have made up. This is serious business. I'll never stop believing that the way, uh, that the way we are living now is not the correct way. If nothing happens regarding 2012. Welcome to hell. Wow. Okay. Do you see how much people have invested in 2012? It's amazing. It's amazing to see how much people have invested in 2012 as a solution to the problems on this planet. Like all of a sudden, it will change everything. It will change everything. That all of a sudden, life will become much better. You know, the good people will have ascended to another earth plane or another star or another dimension while the bad people are running around here uh, fornicating and stabbing each other in the back. Having anal sex and stabbing each other in the back. That's how it'll go down. I don't don't know. I don't know about that. Do I think 2012, 12, 21, 12 is significant? Yes, you bet. I certainly do. Absolutely. Do I think it's going to result in a split earth where, you know, people experience, everybody gets to experience their own version of the rapture? If you're right with your type of God, no, I don't. But I don't think it's insignificant. And in fact, I think I think it's a lot darker than people understand. At least what I think is assembling around that. Uh, here's another one. What is truly sad here is how easy it is to buy people with a simple posting. And what's even sadder is people immediately jumping in the fray of duality. Oh, well. Such is the frailty of humanity. If your heart is full of light, you don't have anything to worry about. That's just my opinion. So then, Greg chimes in. I'm okay with using his name. Greg chimes in and says, yes, it's me, guys. I do not have any answers either. I only know what I'm being told in my head. It's confusing, yes. But perhaps all this mind control talk is true. I experienced it for myself, like I described. The days ahead will shine clarity for all of us. So he comes back in and he says, what's happened? It is true. But then, uh, let's see, this person says, never listen to any channelings. I don't trust any of them. And most everything that people are believing is bullshit. Glad you are where you are now, and hopefully more real, real truth will be spread now. So if this person believes it's bullshit, then why is she subscribing to uh, this page? Hmm. So what really muddies the water now is I went back to his page today, and there's a new message. Here it is. Hello, everyone. I just received a telepathic message and was told that my phone lines, and I'm presenting metaphor here as I do not use an actual phone to channel messages, was hacked. And I received the last couple of messages from, well, I'll let you guess who was sending me these last couple of negative messages. It was not the GFL or the Ashtar command to give you a hint in the right direction. I'm a little uncertain about all this at this time, and I will write a longer and more detailed explanation later on today for you. For it is early here, and I just wanted to get this message out to those who have been following the messages shared through me and have sent me their love and support over the last few days. Keep the faith, everyone, just like all of you did when no one, and I mean not one single light-filled person wavered in their beliefs after reading the last couple of messages I posted. Good for you, everyone. We have been learning to hold fast to our convictions, as you all did. Great job. You should all be very proud of yourselves. 
I also wish to thank everyone for your kind words and all the love and life you have sent my way over the past few days. I love you all, too. Keep shining that light. Greg. Wow. So let's do some of the comments uh, that are going on here. There's only eight now. Let's see. We're all in this together, bro. I knew it. We wait your light to shine our way. Be brave. We all here knows the truth. Peace. Oh, my God. So hung. I am infinity. We are one love. Love, love. What the hell does that mean? Oh, my God. So hung. Is he talking about the size of his penis? Greg's penis? What is that? These last messages are maybe part of the harvesting. Our test as well. Jeez, this is getting ridiculous. You're okay. I'm so glad we missed you. You're all going crazy, laughing my ass off. Most importantly, I'm just glad you're okay. Oh, good. Most importantly. Most importantly, this guy is gone. He is 3,000 people. And more with YouTube videos. And look, I don't know much about him, but a lot of people have been investing their, their time and energy in a guy that's been channeling. Now, I don't, I don't necessarily disparage people tapping into higher sources of wisdom. I don't at all. But to bring people along at a certain point and then, and then kick, drop them at the curb, which may be okay. It may be okay to say, I was wrong. That is a really human thing to do. I was wrong. I got this wrong. And then flip it around and say, well, you know, I was getting messages from somebody else now. I mean, one of the things that is challenging is consistency. It's really hard to be consistent, especially when we're dealing in such abstract realms. You know, it's like I even go through it in my life. I ta- I've taken kind of a semi-forced sabbatical from my blog only because there's so much information to deal with right now. Like, I, I'm flooded with information. I could be writing 24-7 if I wanted to, to try to untangle things. And there's a lot of untangling happening. What, I, what I'm, plus I'm in a nine-year and a nine-month, changes today, by the way, thank God. I'm in a, I'm in a, I've now entered into a one year uh, with a, a one vibration this month and the one day, which is good. I'm into that. So I'm going to pick up the the, uh, the pace here a bit, but it's a chal- It's challenging to be so consistent and to be able to tap into something that actually nurtures yourself and nurtures other people along the way, and to do it in a way that um, is really congruent and, you know, not giving people false hope and not giving people bullshit information. You know, so now what we have here is almost, you know, the, you know, kind of archetypal <clears throat> um, markings of a cult. You know, this is when a cult leader uh, disappoints his people. And now the people go through stages of shock and disbelief, and you know it's it's just it's a fucked up thing. I don't know anything about this guy. I don't know where he's coming from. Uh, when I when I saw that last post, I thought, great, somebody's getting it. And now there's this other post. It's like, wow, man, you're just you're putting people through the psychic ringer. And I just I just don't know if that is really great. And then there are people. There's this one guy that says this Greg Giles guy doesn't even exist. That it's all been a fake. That it's all, you know, bullshit. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I was just shown this uh, series of posts. I have friends on Facebook who follow this guy, by the way. So maybe they can tell you. Some of them might even be in the, uh, the chat room. So self, the whole idea and notion of self, what's that about? 
and how important is it? Well, I'm going through a metamorphosis of self, getting ready to leave a place that I've been most of my life and relocate to a very new area. So this notion of self is kind of an interesting one to me now because, you know, whenever you move, you show up differently. I, you know, a lot of people say that, oh, when you move, you just take your troubles with you. I don't necessarily think that, by the way, mostly because I'm an astrologer, but also because, you know, when you, I believe that when a move occurs, and a move occurs differently for different people. Like, for instance, uh, I am a projector. And as a projector, I have to wait for the invitation. And the invitation came to move. So I, I know in my heart of hearts that who I will ultimately arrive at in that place will be a little bit different than it is here because it fits to the organic flow. So I don't believe that you take your troubles with you all the time, that a move can't be representative of a new psychic structure in one's life. The whole notion and idea and concept of self, fascinating. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to shift into our interview or my interview with the lovely Nia Nell, and we're going to be talking about herself and how she copes with uh, being a, a professional singer, songwriter, and mom. So this is going to bleed over into the, uh, the stream, sorry, the podcast, because I, I went on a bit too long about Greg Giles today. So... Uh, if you listen to this, there's going to be about a, a five-minute lag time, and I'm also going to play a piece of her music at the end, which will be on the podcast. Lovely, lovely music. Okay, so this is uh, from last week. This is the very lovely and talented singer-songwriter, Nianel. She is from South Africa. Maybe I'll just play her music now. I'll tell you what. Let me play a, a piece of her music now so you can listen to it. And then this is going to uh, bleed over into the podcast. Okay. All right, so this is from Nia Now. Love, uh, it's a wonderful piece of music. This I Know. This is the name of the track, This I Know. And then I'll just go right into the interview after the track. You're listening to the Monday Mashup. I'm Robert Phoenix.
Instrumentalist, uh, all the way from South Africa. She plays piano. She plays guitar. She's an author. A motivational book called "Knowing Who I Am," uh, and she is the uh, the singer and songwriter of a wonderful piece of music called "Who Painted the Moon." Her latest record is "My Heart," and all the way from South Africa, it's Nianel. Thank you for coming on the show today, Nianel. It's very nice to meet you. Wonderful to talk to you. So one of the things, uh, this is the first time we've spoken, I've, and I come from a music background, and this is actually the first time I've ever heard your music, and uh, it's very lovely. And one of the things that really struck me when I when I heard Who Painted the Moon is how much you sounded like a country and western singer, uh, not in and not in a derogatory way, but in, in the you know in, in, in the best way. And I'm wondering how much country and western music you listened to while you were growing up. You know, Robert, um, I grew up in Namibia, mm-hmm. and uh, we weren't exposed to a lot of music. Um, I grew up in a, in a family who was very musical. So my father, he, he was a huge country fan. Uh, um, and he, he, you know, the style of music that he liked to play is, is very country-oriented. So I think I kind of um, heard that from him. I myself find it very difficult to to feel music uh, when I listen to it. You know, I have to actually perform it, and then I feel it through my audience. So I, I I'm not really, I uh, haven't been really exposed to a lot of music. To be honest with you, I, I don't listen to music quite often. I know people find it very strange because they just think, um, if you're a musician, you listen to a lot of music. But um, yeah, I feel it through audiences. So whenever I write a song, I go and call somebody and say, please sit here. So that I can play it for you, and then I kind of feel it through them. Mm-hmm. But my father is um, a big huge country fan, and we, like I said, as we grew up, um, we listened to to his style of music that he likes, and um, very country oriented. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting that you say that because I've noticed that people who are very serious athletes, like baseball players or football players or soccer players, they don't really follow sports. You know, they're much more engaged in the, in the actual playing. <laughs> Of their uh, of their of their craft or their their sport, so I think I think there's some crossover to this. When 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 did you first figure out when you were a young girl that uh, that you love to sing? You have a four octave range, by the way, which is fairly fairly rare and unusual. When when did you first figure out that this is what you wanted to do, and and what were some of the things that you had to overcome in order to really live your passion and be able to sing and create music? Um, you know, Robert, when I was um, about seven, eight years old, I I already sounded like a grown-up when I sang. Um, when I speak, I, I tend to have this um, quiet kind of voice, but when I when I sang, I had this huge adult, um, almost operatic sound in my in my voice. 
Um, so it was quite strange, you know, that the children used to tease me in school, but you know, anything that's different, um, you know, they seem to think it's funny. Um, the neighbors used to, used to pay me two rand to sing for them. And I would say my biggest challenge was that I didn't quite come um, with the personality that, that, that suits this voice, you know. My voice and my gift was so enormous, and, and my personality, um, I'm, a, I'm a definite introvert, very shy. I was terrified of people. I was so scared of people. I used to spend most of my time hiding away and just, you know, trying to be by myself. Um, so that was my biggest challenge. And, you know, I'm actually turning 41 tomorrow. <laughs> and I always joke, I said, it, it took me about um, 38, almost 40 years to kind of grow into this voice. And, and that's just an amazing thing of life because I think we come to this earth fully equipped, you know, to, to deliver this message that we all come to earth to do. Um, we just need to develop it. Uh, I, I, I'm an introvert, but I developed my extrovert side. And today, you know, I'm, I'm completely extrovert on stage. People don't even believe that I used to be afraid and scared to speak in front of, uh, in front of people. Um, you know, so, so I think that was my biggest challenge, just learning and growing into this gift that I foresee. And then also kind of accepting my words and just become comfortable with who I am, understanding that I'm not, you know, what I achieve. Um, what I have, how I look, um, not even by what people think of me, and just discovering that I'm unconditional love and that I need to find and see that love within myself and nurture through it and focus on that, and then I will see it in others and I won't be afraid anymore. Mm. And the thing about music that I love is, is it can be such a pure gift. You know, it's, uh, it's not uh, political. Um, uh, in some cases, it can have an agenda, but when it's really pure, it's and you're really reaching into the voice as an instrument, and you're uh, and people like yourself who sing material that's inspirational or emotional or, or loving. Um, it, and for me, it's one of the highest forms of service um, that anyone can can perform and bring to this planet. And you being a Libra, obviously, you're here to express beauty and in poetry. And soul, when you perform on stage in front of people, how conscious of you uh, are you of this process? And what does it feel like to be really open and in the moment where you're truly expressing what you're here to do? I take a lot of time before I walk on stage to, um, you know, just to kind of chat to my ego and ask my ego to kind of stay in the dressing room so that I can go on stage just completely open to whatever needs to flow through me. So that I do not expect anything of my audience, but so that I'm just, um, you know, just a vessel of, of, of just love, unconditional love. And I know that if I can give that love to myself, um, I don't need to expect anything from my, from my audience. Um, then I'm actually in the moment, truly enjoying the moment. And when that happens, it's magic, you know, and um, it's just an amazing feeling. And, and I think lately I've been having such amazing shows the last, the four days I've been on tour, I think I had a total of uh, four or five hours sleep in the four days. But I've had, an, I've had amazing performances. And, and I think just to convey that message of love, you, you need to feel it for yourself. And you've got to be honest and, and totally not afraid to open up completely and give yourself completely to your audience and to yourself. Mm, yeah. Well, you, you, you not only give to your art, uh, but you also have a, a pretty considerable commitment outside of, of music. You're a mother, and you have triplets, right? That's right. And, and, and they're all girls, correct? Is that, is that right? <laughs> That's correct. They, they just turned five years old. They're so amazing. We love them to bits, and they keep us entertained, and they keep us busy. Um, yeah, you know, you, you mentioned the fact that I'm a Libra, so... One of my favorite parts of being a leader is to, to keep that perfect balance in your life, you know, spend enough time. But I think if you if you love everything that you do, if you're passionate about what you're doing, you always find the energy and the strength to, to keep going and to just, you know, um, I, I, I'm a firm believer that people, you know, don't waste time with things that, you, that you're not passionate about. And thank goodness I'm passionate about my children and about my husband and my music and, and just inspiring and, and loving people. So, I do what I love. Well, that, so would you say then, because a lot of people find it hard to have 
balance in their lives. And you obviously have a career, full-time career, full-time mom, and you also have a relationship. You know, if somebody, you know, who doesn't know a lot about you is just finding out about you now um, and hears your music and is, is inspired and finds out more about your life, what kind of advice would you give that person about how to achieve balance in all these different arenas in their lives or in their life? You know what, I think um, to be a great mother, to be a wonderful wife, to be successful in your career, and to keep balance, you need to focus on yourself first. Um, and I mean in an unconditional way, because um, if you're okay, if you are the best you, you can be a great mom, and you can be a great partner for your husband, and you can be a success in your career. And that takes a lot of work. You know, I wake up in the morning, and I choose to love myself. I choose to see the best in myself. I choose to forgive myself. I choose to be kind and gentle to myself. And I spend a lot of time focusing on this because I firmly believe that what you focus on, that will grow. And so I focus on the best part in me. I focus on being the best me. And, you know, for me, that is that is the most important part in anything in life. So um, I've got the best, uh, I think the best, um, relationship advice I ever got was if you spot it, you've got it. So, mm -hmm. you know, instead of focusing on other people's problems, I focus on, on, you know, on myself, and then naturally that will flow over. You know, the one thing that I want to teach my three-year-old girls is to love themselves, because I know that if they can achieve that, they will have a great life. I've seen it in my own life, you know, and, um, and the only way we teach is by our example, so that is, the, that is the, the whole reason for my book. It's my guide to unconditionally love myself. And I think this concept, um, I mean, it's, it's so old. But because it's so simple, it's really not difficult. It's not complicated. It's just so simple that we, we tend to overlook the importance of it. You know? And I believe that every problem on earth can be solved if, if we start looking within ourselves and we start learning to love and accept and neutral and forgive ourselves mm -hmm. and judging ourselves because I mean, if, if you can achieve that within yourself, it will naturally flow into the rest of the world and people around you. Uh, were you were you raised in a religious household? I was raised, um, yes. I, I'm from a Christian background, and um, so I studied and looked at almost every religion since then. Um, we were very religious. My, my parents were very religious um, in, in a Christian thing. Um, I don't even know if you have an in here church in America or what, or, or what would that be. It's very close to Methodist. Uh huh. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, I have come to learn, for me, my opinion today is that I truly respect and accept all religions. Excuse me, I've got a cough. Can <coughs> <coughs> just take a sip of water? Sorry. No worries. Yeah, so um, for me, I truly believe that there is a place on earth for every religion, every culture, every language, every color. And uh, I, I truly believe in unity. I, I believe that we are all united, we're all one. Um, and I accept all religions and all cultures. Um, because I believe that we're all one. I believe that there is. Um, I have a, a, a great respect for what other people believe and for what makes them feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I truly never have to try and convince them otherwise. You know, I just I believe that um, we can all live peacefully on this earth in, in whichever religion or faith you feel comfortable in. Um, and I think that is what unconditional love is to truly accept and just love everything as it is and not try and change it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting, you know, the dichotomy between like a traditional religious background, especially Christian, which would say uh, you love God unconditionally and, and you know, and, and technically Jesus died for your sins and you just let God take care of everything and, and then the love will come through the mystery of the Holy Trinity, right? But what you're talking about is loving the self unconditionally. And it's kind of a different model. Is there is, is there a, a bridge between these two versions of faith, or, or do you think that they're really just one and the same? 
Um, you know, I believe that I am one with God. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe that we are all, I believe we're all one with God, and I, I believe that God is within within us. So loving the self for me is one and the same in loving God and loving yourself, mm-hmm. um, because I think we're all creations, um, and we're all created, um, you know, and we're all part of God. So uh, that is how I see it. I've never seen myself or even felt myself separate from God. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that is. Uh, that's a part for me that was, um, that is sad, you know, um, that if you ever feel separate from God, that is, for me, would be very sad, mm-hmm. because I don't think we're separate from God, mm-hmm. and because I believe that all one with God, um, I, I believe that, that that love is so important for yourself, because for me, that's equal to love to God, you know? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that uh, is kind of big right now in the United States uh, is to look at the music industry um, as being kind of this vessel for the Illuminati and, um, you know, how certain singers and songwriters are either programmed or they've, they've, they've made unsavory deals with nefarious people. Uh, and it's part of the business, and, and that's actually been part of the business ever since, you know, Robert Johnson, you know, went down to the crossroads, how do you maintain a sense of purity, and particularly spiritual purity, in a business that can be really dark at times? Um, By controlling my fears. Um, I I feel that um, this world is so controlled by fear, Mm -hmm. and that we allow fear to control us. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, we are all victims. If you allow any emotion, anything like fear, um, guilt or anything like that to control you, um, you're helpless, you're a victim, and I, I refuse to be a victim. Um, I've, I've decided a long time ago that I'm taking control, and I know that, and I, I trust and I, and I believe this with 100% of my heart, that where there's love, there's no fear. So, um, I say it again, it is such a simple com- uh, uh, it is so simple that people can actually, they find it so hard to believe that, that love is the, is the cure for everything, you know? Yeah. Um, and when you remain within that, when you remain within unconditional love all the time, if that is your focus, nothing else really matters. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think, I think you're, you know, you're on it. It's very, very simple, and sometimes it's so simple we lose sight of it. Um, you, you, I think you're on the threshold of being an international star. I mean, that's kind of what it feels like with um, your your song and your book, your songs and your book and your work, and you've actually performed on the same stage or or uh, with uh, some pretty famous people. Uh, one of which is Christina Aguilera. What was that like for you? You know, when we, when we perform with with the Americans, it's very interesting for us because um, um, you hardly get to see them. I mean, her dressing room was about. Um, five meters, ten meters away from my dressing room, um, and you know, <laughs> your celebrities is, 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 is huge. We, we don't do it so big in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, the bodyguards will follow up the dressing room to the stage and back to the dressing room, so there's no chance for a photo or even a high, you know. <laughs> so that was on the same stage. But then I performed with artists like Andrea Pacelli, and the two of us actually sang together. Um, so, you know, we rehearsed together and get to know each other. Um, so that's nice. But I think if I sang, not just on the same stage, but that probably sang a song with Christina, it would, it would have been an opportunity to get in a bit of it. Just being on the same stage at the same event, it's very difficult to, to actually to, to meet them because they're very, very well protected. So she's, <laughs> you know, yeah. That, um, she's pretty controlled. I think isn't in she? America, the. Um, yeah, I think I think um, what I've noticed, um, even with uh, with Shakira, I mean, the bodyguards really protect them. Um, I think we find it kind of amusing in South Africa because we do not storm or <laughs> or attack, you know, celebrities here. I, I think we kind of we have a we have a respect here that we don't just you know I'm, I never get bothered. People will say hi and stuff like that, but I won't be you know um, ran over or. We don't have paparazzi like you guys have over there, and I think um, I think it must be very difficult for for the staff over there, you know, to have a bit of a private. We're lucky over here, 
So we don't have it like that, you know. So um, I think that's why a lot of stars come and visit South Africa. It's a bit of privacy for you. So uh, what's it like in South Africa now? I mean, I mean, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you guys went through apartheid, and then, you know, that broke up, and now you've got a, a fairly mixed and multiracial uh, society there. What, what's what's the daily life in South Africa like these days? I think South Africa is um, probably, and, you know, and I'm from Namibia as well. Namibia and South Africa are very close to each other. I think it's um, probably the best place on earth to live on. You know, I'm, I feel so thankful to, to live here. We are very spoiled. We are um, the most beautiful country you've ever seen in your life. Um, the people here are friendly, they're loving, they're kind. Um, and I'm talking about all the cultures within South Africa and Namibia. I mean, I think we have the most loving, loving people here. Um, but then again, Robert, you know, you will experience people wherever you are, and you will experience the country that you are. So I think because I'm very loving and, and open to people, that is the way that they respond to me. Um, and um, I don't know, I see such a bright future for South Africa. I, I, there's, there's no place on earth that I would rather live in, and I, I, I just find the people here very, very um, amazing. Well, I don't know if you've... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's okay. No, I, I, was, I was just going to say, I don't know if you've seen the movie 2012, which is about uh, the end of the world, but the uh, the place where everybody ends up is in South Africa. That's where the new world starts, right? So um, maybe you're in the right place yeah. at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I saw the movie. And I said, whew, uh, we're here, we're in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, no, I think it's so amazing. When I was when I was born, I was born in a place called um, Omoruru. Now, that is in Namibia. It used to be South Africa, Africa and then it, it became independent, and they called it Namibia. Mm -hmm. That is an amazing, amazingly beautiful country. And it was such a small little town. I was, I was the only baby in the hospital. And I grew up, and then we moved to Vinci, which is the capital. And Namibia is very small, and I always used to wonder, because I mean, I, I received this great gift, and I thought, this is an odd place to, you know, to choose, to come to, and I, I always wondered, why am I, why am I born in this place where there's no music industry, because there was no mu music industry in Namibia, yeah? Right. Um, I moved to South Africa, which is slightly bigger, but I mean, everything kind of happens in America and Europe, it's, it's really big with you guys. And then as time passed and as I grew older, I just realized, you know, there's no accident. Uh, we are born exactly where we're meant to. Um, whatever happens to us is exactly what's supposed to. And I'm just so, so grateful for this journey now, you know. And I'm, I'm so thankful that I'm in South Africa. And, I, and, I, and, you know, for me, it doesn't really matter where you are. I think it's just um, how open you are to the lessons and to, to life and to learning and growing. Mm. So I just I feel so thankful to be in South Africa. I think it's I think it's an amazing place. If I if I could um, invite people and and it's a safe place. I mean it's it's um people think it's, it's you know you need to be nervous and afraid to come here and because of you know what the news is. But I mean you know you know the news that you know they just focus on all the negative and not just in our country but on every country. I mean if you watch the news that's what you would see the, the bad stuff that happens all over the world, you know. Um, I experienced South Africa as a very safe. Um, I've never been uh, robbed or attacked. I have a beautiful life. Uh, I travel between Johannesburg and Cape Town. Uh, in Johannesburg, we do a lot of our business, and in Cape Town, we relax. We're in Cape Town now, so I just, I find this country so beautiful, and, and once you visit South Africa, you, you always want to come back and you want to actually stay here. Well, one of my favorite uh, songs of all time uh, it was sung by a South African, and uh, it, it, he was actually a member of the Beach Boys for about a year. His name was Blondie Chaplin. Do you know who Blondie Chaplin is? I'm um, not quite sure. So he sang a song with the Beach Boys called Sail On Sailor. Um, very interesting story. He he was Yeah, yeah so he was with a, a drummer by the name of Ricky Fatar. And um, they were part of a, a, a band uh, that was uh, playing in London, and Dennis Wilson 
discovered them in London and signed them to the Beach Boys label. He wound up actually, he and Ricky actually became members of the Beach Boys for, I think, one record. And he sings the vocals for Sail on Sailor. It's a tremendous song. Um, so do you tour the United States at all with, with, uh, with your music? You know what? I'm going to visit the United States for the first time this year, and I'm quite excited. Um, I've been to Europe before, but I've never been to the States. So I'm going now in November to, to go and talk at the I Can Do a Conference mm-hmm. um, at the Hay House. So that will be my first visit, and I'm going to New York. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Is, that. is that the Ignite Conference? Is that what you're going to? That's right. Yes, I'll be performing there. I've got my little oh, small 20 minutes. I don't know what you're gonna do in that. <laughs> right, time. right, yeah. And I'm going, I'm going, I'm, I'm going there for ten days, and I'm just looking forward to, to listen to all the other speakers as well and just to enjoy the experience. Um, well, I actually I have a very good friend that lives in New York, and she's from South Africa, and she's a publicist, and her husband has a pretty sophisticated recording studio there. So, anyway, um, that's exciting stuff. Yeah. It, yeah, really. I mean, I think you guys would actually connect, by the way. Um, now, your book. Okay, that's wonderful. Yeah, no, I, I'd, lo- I'd love to hook the two of you. Her name is Jackie. Um, your book, Knowing Who I Am, that's on Hay House. How long has that been out? Actually, it's only been launched now. On the 15th of October, it will be released. Um, it's a very interesting story, you know, because when you turn 40, um, you buy presents for yourself. So last year, my it was a gift to myself to go. Um, on a trip with Dr. Wayne Dyer, um, uh, it, was, uh, it was called the Experience in the Miraculous Tour, mm-hmm. and I bought myself this trip actually while I was writing the book. So the, the book's been launched in South Africa already, uh, it's doing very really well over here. But last, last year I went on this journey, and um, the, uh, the idea of the, of the journey was just uh, to kind of rest. You know, my, my trip was just four years old, and I... I thought I deserved a bit of a break, you know. <laughs> so I went on this journey, and it was so amazing. I remember, I'll never forget the first day. Um, we were sitting in Italy in a big cathedral, and Dr. Wayne Dyer was doing a talk. And um, I started feeling this push from behind, you know, definitely my angels. They're very pushy at times. So I was, I really had this strong desire to go and sing. And I'm thinking, wow, well, I can't do this, you know. I'm a professional singer, and and at that point, um, I was so I will never push. I will never push myself. You know, I had to be invited or asked up. I won't just walk up and and sing. And I was sitting there, and at that moment, when I got this incredible desire to sing and this push from behind, um, Dr. Wendy, I said he can take a five minute break and he talk. And I can't tell you how that happened, but from my chair. When I saw again, I was standing on stage in front of Dr. Wayne Dyer, and I looked at him, and I couldn't believe what I said. I said to him, um, can I sing a song? <laughs> you know, my ego was taking over. I felt so embarrassed. I, I listened to myself and thought, what am I doing? I couldn't be, even believe I'm standing on stage. I, I can't even remember from my chair to the stage. And he looked at me, and he was so shocked, and he said to me, he said, no. And I said to him, um, no, 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 maybe afterwards. But now I'm so embarrassed, you know, my ego is really taking over. And I actually want to stop crying. I felt so insecure. And he said to me, well, he'll see, maybe afterwards. And, you know, I couldn't wait to get off the stage because I was so embarrassed at that point. And then he turned around and he said to me, what language were you singing? So I said to him, and then it's like something took over again. And I walked up to him and I took him by his shoulder and I said to him, don't worry. It'll be all right, you know. I felt so strange. I felt like I was too busy or something. And then he said, okay, well, we'll see afterwards. So when he sat down, I actually started crying when I walked up the stage because I was so embarrassed. I couldn't believe what I just did, you know. And I sat in between all the people and um, enjoyed his talk. And when he was done, he, he suddenly got very emotional on stage because it, it was just, it was such a beautiful thing. And, and, and I mean, the energy um, was so amazing in there. And he was emotional, and for, for a minute, everybody stood up. He just, you know, kind of felt the moment with him. And in, in all of that emotion, he suddenly said, oh, yeah, there was a little who wanted to sing a song. You know, so I didn't have to be invited twice. I was on there, and I even wanted to start singing without the microphone. I mean, I was really not myself, you know, <laughs> I'm a professional singer. But he insisted, no, take the microphone. I'm, 
I'm sure he was thinking, oh my word, what's coming next? You know? And I sang a song that I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, it's called Finally. Um, I'm alive, finally. Um, and the whole song, the lyrics of it just kind of means that, you know, you're taking control of your fears. And, um, I can truly tell you that this year is actually the first year that I've, I've actually managed to, to really apply that concept in my life and give myself permission to be who I am. Even last year, I still didn't quite. And I think I'll, I'll grow all the time. And I think next year when we speak, I'll say, oh, no, now I'm doing it really right. You know? So yeah. it's just a process. And it's, I think it's a lifelong, lifelong process. But I was saying, and I must say, this, this is one of the first audiences that uh, the people came after this and they said to me, wow, you know, what amazing look. And I was so moved because that's all I ever wanted people to hear was the lyrics and the messages because I can't take credit for that. Um, messages come through me all the time. And I sit amazed and listen to them because uh, these are concepts and wisdom that I still cannot apply in my own life. You know? um, even languages that come through me that I don't even understand. I, I, I write to down phonetically and that's how I perform it. Um, right throughout my range. On, on my new album, My Heart, there's a song called this I know is the first song here from my website. And you'll hear there's a part that's really, really low. It almost sounds like a man singing, but that's the range that this message came. And it came in a language, and I just think it still broke it down. So I just feel so blessed. And on that journey, singing this song there, it opened doors for me. And um, I was offered um, 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 a release my book through Hay House. And that's where I met it today from Hay House. And it's, it was a wonderful blessing for me. Um, you know, the one time that you go on a journey and you just give yourself something and you're letting go and, and, and the goal is just to go and enjoy and rest and just be. When the goal is to just be, that is when things really, really happen. Yes, I, I agree with you completely. You know, here, you know, I don't know what, what you talk about, how you frame it and South Africa, but we talk about it here, you know, staying close to your source or being close to source and, and not, you know, uh, wandering off or being diverted from source. That's And once you get to that place, you just want to stay there and hang out there and, you know, be as, as, as uh, connected to it as possible, right? Absolutely, absolutely. What an amazing place to be. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, one of the things I think that's probably very important for you in your life is your relationship with your husband, who is also your manager. Can you just talk a little bit about uh, the importance of that relationship and, and how it also reflects your connection with Source? You know, I think um, a relationship with your, with your husband is, is, is a very intimate one because, I mean, he's there all the time. And especially when you work together and you parents together, you live together, it's very important to, to make time for each other. Um, but also, I think there again, like in the rest of life, focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. Because um, when there's something in you know irritating you or something that makes you angry or um, to the point where you actually address it all the time, then you got to just take a focus within yourself because you wouldn't have noticed it in the first place if you're not guilty of it, you know, yourself. Um, I actually wrote a little story in my book um, about that, you know, and I think. I truly say, if you spot it, you got it. So any, any relationship can be resolved and can be successful if you keep the focus on your side of things. Because we cannot change other people. Um, you can only change yourself, you know. And um, the harder you try to change the person, the more things go wrong, you know, because you put pressure on other people and they feel that there's stuff being ex expected from them and that's how things go wrong. Um, a relationship with yourself is already... So complicated, I don't know about you, but you know, um, <laughs> the relationship with yourself it, it isn't always easy. Now, if you add another person into that and then three little ones as well, you know, that becomes complicated. And I, I believe in, in just focusing and working on things, you know, if, if there's a problem, first go and see within yourself how can you fix this, where do you need to work. You know, I have a huge thing with inconsiderate people. For me, I must say, I, I, every now and again, I get overwhelmed by um, inconsiderateness. And um, when I was working many years ago with my last coach, she used to ask me, I said, what is the one thing that would bother me in other people? And I say, well, they're inconsiderateness. So she says, okay, let's see where you consider it. 
And that day my husband was actually gay and he said, no, no, she's not inconsiderate, no, she's very considerate. And then my life got sick. So how considerate are you towards yourself? And that's the thing, you know, um, I'm incredibly inconsiderate towards myself because I will always say yes, I couldn't put the limits, and I do everything for everybody else to the point where I'm so exhausted and so tired that I'm annoyed by everybody else's inconsiderate. And the way that you solve this is to focus on your own um, inconsiderateness towards yourself, you know, and the minute um, people now, today, come across as inconsiderate to me, I uh, spend time with myself and I try and work on being more considerate towards myself. And it's amazing how people then just don't bother me anymore, you know. So I think the trick is always to know that if it bothers you and also how much it bothers you, that means that's how much you need to work within yourself. Right. Um, in any relationship, that's the best advice I could ever receive and give. Well, that's great advice. Well, Nina, your, your music is absolutely lovely your message is lovely you're lovely i think you're going to have a fantastic 2013 sounds to sounds to me like things are really lining up for you and uh, so i want to thank you for spending time with me and the listeners and if people want to find out more about um your music your book and 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 everything about you where can they do that they um they can visit my website um www dot now that's n I A N E L L Mia Mel dot com. Um, and I've got a Facebook and YouTube page and everything on the website. So it's www dot Mia Mel dot com. And your music is downloadable, obviously through iTunes as well, right? Yeah, they um, on my website. It's very clear. If you want to purchase something, it'll take you directly to iTunes or wherever you can purchase it from. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, all the information on the website. Wonderful. All right. Well. I wish you all the best and uh, have a great time in New York. And who knows, maybe I, you can run into my uh, my South African dear friend Jackie there and, and uh, maybe make some music along the way, okay? That would be amazing, Robert. It was amazing um, talking to you. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, it means a lot to me. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. That was the lovely and talented Nia Nell, and all the way from South Africa. And it was great to have that little chat with her and find out a little bit of insight into her life or her, her music and how she manages all those things in the midst of being a mom with three young girls and career and all that stuff. Yes. Welcome to Good Morning America. This is Robert Phoenix. I've been your host. No. So, uh, again, thank you, Nina, and uh, look forward to hearing more from you and about you through your music and your work. You've been listening to the Monday Mashup, and we've been getting into these, whole, this whole concept and identity of identity and self. What is it? How important is it? And <clears throat> how you can tap into it to sustain who you are in a very turbulent time. And I want you to take care of yourself in the very best way as well. And only you know what that is. You can find out and you can figure out what it is just by checking in and seeing what's healthy and getting to that healthy spot, the healthy, happy spot, as quickly as possible. All right. I'll be back on Wednesday, and I'll be navigating the astrological matrix. A lot going on out there. Heavy full moon this last weekend. I'll talk to you on Wednesday. Take care. And you know the drill. Use your head to discern what's real. Your heart. To you stay open to what's possible. This is Robert Phoenix, and you're listening to the Monday Mashup. We are living in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu. Perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words, I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.